Don DeLillo, the author of Underworld, amongst many others, and one of the big fictures, fi fictures? Figures in modern American literature, has now become a classic, a penguin classic. His books are being produced with the sort of cover that we're more accustomed to seeing wrapped around a Dickens or an Austen. He doesn't do many interviews, but I did speak to him yesterday, and I asked him what it's like to be a living classic. It's frightening. I, I remember reading the Penguin Poets, and now I find myself in the same part of the animal kingdom. It's intimidating, but I can adjust. It, it is a, a, a real honor, but, but slightly frightening in the sense that we think of our classics inevitably as, as dead writers. Yes, one feels close to that state, uh, often in the middle of a novel. Every novelist begins to think about mortality in connection with the book he's writing to finish the book before you die. How extraordinary. Is, is this in part at least, although we're talking about different things clearly, but, but your, your new play, Love Lies Bleeding, deals with mercy killing and death. Is this, uh, does this play a part in that? No, I don't think so. Love Lies Bleeding comes in, in an odd way from the very first sentence of dialogue. It's a line that I've been carrying in my mind for three or four or five years. The line is simply, I saw a dead man on the subway once, and I knew that at some point the line would take hold to the extent that I would have to sit down and write another sentence, and then another. And what do you conclude, because this is a, a powerful political issue here in, in Britain, or at least ethical issue at, at the moment, that is to say our approach to mercy killing or assisted suicide, whatever, however you want to describe it, do you, on, on what side of the argument do you come down? I tend to lean toward life in a general way. I, I don't know quite how to elaborate on that. Your books, obviously, any author's books speak for the, the writer, but you've been doing a lot of speaking, or quite a lot of speaking, on your own account recently about uh, what is happening in the United States. What do you mean when you say things like, we've been feeling a sort of homesickness for power in this country, never underestimate the willingness of the state to act out its own massive fantasies? Do, do you have Iraq in mind when you talk? In, in those terms? Not originally, no, but I do think Iraq is the realization of a fantasy contained in the mind of a few men that perhaps involved the best intentions, but intentions that were extraordinarily naive, as it turned out. I'm not all that comfortable discussing such matters publicly. At the pen evenings uh, that I took part in, we were simply reading writers other than ourselves rather than making straightforward political statements of our own. Let me put to you, if I may, then a couple of points that you've made in your book, the, the, this, these uh, phrases in, in, in your own language. And you're talking about um, terrorism, and obviously that's a subject you've addressed in, in books such as Underworld and Mao too. Uh, I think the culture absorbs almost everything. It cannot absorb terrorist attacks. This is too powerful. What does that mean? At a certain point, American culture in particular became so all-consuming that it began to consume even shocks to the culture. Whatever sort of atrocity seemed to be perpetrated became part of the industry of consuming and selling and advertising. One of the few exceptions to this is terrorism itself. A writer who, who perhaps writes revolutionary books may still find himself adorning a shopping bag or a coffee mug. There is a sense in which novelists could help determine the way people perceive the world around them. But now it seems that the world narrative is being written by terrorists, by despots of various kinds. It has dominated not only our discourse, but uh, to, to some degree our consciousness. But they can only do that if we allow them to do it, can't they? But how do we stop them from doing it? We can and we try to, but once an atrocity is committed, how do we keep from becoming obsessed by it? How do, how do we suppress our fear? During the um, years of the Cold War, the threat of an overwhelming cataclysm was ever-present, but it didn't quite have the same intimate effect that such events uh, that we've witnessed in Madrid and London and New York and elsewhere 
have on ordinary people. Getting on trains, going to the office, sitting in your home, riding in a taxi. For some people, the threat is inescapable. Isn't the first thing that a mature democracy has to do is say, however you say it, we will not be intimidated. That's to say, we won't do the terrorist work for them by, for instance, clamping down on freedoms that existed, freedoms of expression or whatever it may be, before that terrorist attack. That's the way government ought to be run, but it seems um, this is a, a difficult line to, to walk, at least for the current administration. Do you believe that Guantanamo Bay should not exist? For these reasons, I, either it should not exist, or or it should be a great deal uh, smaller uh, in in terms of the number of people being held. What your books do, some of them anyway, and 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 I'm thinking, I suppose, partly of, of uh, Americana, but others, they paint a, a fairly uh, bleak picture of modern America, a land that has reached the end of its real. I'm thinking here of of of. Uh, of Americana, obviously, Joyce Carol Oates said of it, nearly every sentence of Americana rings true for that reason. Do you have a, a bleak view of your own country and the way it's developed over the last few decades? I, I never set out to write in a pessimistic way or an optimistic way or a bleak way or a hopeful way. I just write what appears to be before me, what I see and hear and feel. And I don't think in those larger terms um, as, as many other people are able to do. Don DeLillo, many thanks.